I'm going to go live. Hold on a minute. I'm going to go live on Facebook. And then, and then we can start. <clears throat> All right. So let's see. I'm just going to um, put in a title here. Um, Oh. Does it go live on the on the on which page? It's gonna go live on uh, on my um uh on my uh, on Vera Vina Gusto on Facebook, right? Not Insta. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So just assume that we're live now. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. So the me tasting with us. So Zoom is uh yeah, here. <laughs> So, uh, Bur Burley, is that your um, your tasting room there that we're looking it's at? My tasting room. I have a little camera, so we have our little plates here. So nice. Everything. It's nice and propped up. <laughs> Good. So when people walk in, they'll be able to kind of taste and along with well, you. And stuff. If we did that, we might have complications. <laughs> so these are oh, okay. These are the designated tasters. Okay. Because hey there. I think it Hi, I'm Sheila. Yeah. Okay, well, I believe that we are live now. Um, so let me get everyone uh, into the um, into the room. And hi, everyone. This is Sheila Dunyu of Vero. Uh, we source small production sustainable wines and olive oils from around the world, and we sell them across the U.S to businesses and consumers. Our website is Vero Vino Gusto. And, um, and today we have with us uh, Antonella Manuli, who is founder of La Maliosa, which is a farm in Marema, Tuscany. And, um, and she makes, uh, she cultivates and makes natural wines and olive oils. So we'll be talking with her today and tasting her, some of her wines and olive oils. We have Ruth Ryberg and I'm Burley Tuggle with us as well. So uh, Ruth is normally based in Georgia, although she just uh, went up to Maine, uh, I guess for the summer, right, Ruth? Yep. And um, so R Ruth is a sommelier and has um, several uh, wine wine certifications that I don't have memorized, but, uh, <laughs> but she, no she is... <laughs> She's a great moderator, and if you follow us, um, we've been. Um, she's been a, uh, a moderator uh, on a number of talks that we've had, and we also have Burley Tuggle, who's in Newark, New Jersey, along with some of her friends. Right? Yes. yes. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so Bur Burley is also a. Uh, um, a wine wine professional. She has a lot of uh, also s several wine certifications. WSCT. I haven't again. I haven't memorized that, but um, but I know that she um, not only does she know her stuff, but she's also really passionate about um, about what what uh, about basically uh, introducing people to interesting wines and learning about. Um, uh, not only wines, but also olive oils. So, um, so anyway, um, I guess at this point, I'll turn it over to Ruth. 
Ruth hey, will be moderating the um, uh, and, and guiding us through the wine Thanks, tasting. Thank you, um, I'd like to welcome everybody who's on live today. And um, we're really happy you're here. We're going to talk a little bit about um, natural wine and how it, it is the uh, brainchild of La Maliosa and um, Antonella. Uh, but Antonella, before we do, I'd like to tell everybody a little, little bit about where we're located because most people think of Italian wine being in Tuscany, being from Chianti or Montepulciano, and that's central Tuscany. And you're in Morema, which is down on the coast. So what is different about Morena? And why is it a good wine region? OK, so uh, Marema corresponds basically. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me, everybody. I'm, I'm really happy to be here uh, tonight uh, with all of you and uh, happy to speak about La Maliosa. So um, Maremma uh, is, is a region, is, is a part of Tuscany corresponding to the, basically to this province of Grosseto. You can see the town there in the, in the round figure. And um, uh, so we, it, it's, it's quite um, different from the rest of Tuscany as far as the environment. This, this is one thing. Um, it, it has the highest uh, biodiversity of, of all of Tuscany and, and we can also say of, of all of Italy. It's really um, kind of unique region as far as the unspoiled environment. We have a lot of forests, we, you know, we have um, uh, Mediterranean, a lot of Mediterranean um, uh, plants, you know, and, uh, and bushes. Uh, a lot of sm different smells and also uh, not just vegetal biodiversity, also animal, <laughs> you know, we have any kind of, uh, of uh, I think we have the most animals uh, you can imagine outside of Africa. I mean, except for the big five, I think we I think we have everything here. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a, um, a unique place. Uh, but, uh, um, of course, it doesn't have the wine tradition of Chianti, which is the, the historical place where people have been making wine uh, in Tuscany, of course. Um, however, it has uh, very uh, favorable conditions for viticulture, especially the climate is, is absolutely um, very um, favorable. Um, and this is important when we think of natural wine because um, you can't make natural wine everywhere. This is one concept I would like to uh, express. Um, natural wine, you need to have some conditions uh, uh, as far as, as the terroir where, where you're going to make this wine. And we have absolutely very, very good conditions to make wine in general and, and even more natural wine here in Maremma. So Antonella, what would those conditions be? What are the conditions that makes it the best place for natural wine? Well, it is not the best, but it's very, very favorable for, uh, for, for natural wine. wine. Well, first of all, we have very dry. It's dry, the climate. Um, it's, uh, we have uh, always a little bit of a breeze um and uh so so th this is, is is good you know we also have warmth um so we we have enough heat to uh make the the grapes uh become ripe well um and also there are some however even even if it's not the most historical place in tuscany to make wine we have some very interesting um, historical uh, varieties here in Maremma. And also there is another thing that is quite unique to Maremma that uh, not uh, almost nobody knows actually. Uh, we have some areas where we have volcanic soils because the, the, uh, there is a volcano, an extinct volcano that is called Amiata, which is quite close to where La Maliosa is. And we have some vineyards uh, near the Amiata on the volcanic soil. Um, and this is very important to make white wines. Of course, if you are a sommelier, an expert in wine, you know this. So um, this is all also part of why it's, it's a very good place to make wine, uh, Maremma. 
So I have a question about the natural wine. That's sort of our focus for today. Um, that's your expertise. And I was wondering if you could share with us how it all began. Mm -hmm. um, when you opened your winery, what made you decide you wanted to do natural wine, the way, make wine the way you do? Um, yeah. Give us just a little bit of history. Okay. So the nice thing about La Maliosa is we don't have a history. You know, you know how uh, when everybody starts speaking about their winery, they start for the grandfather and then the father and then the sister and the uncle. And no, it's not nothing of, of that. It's just me. And uh, this, this idea I had because um, I have been working in Maremma since uh, basically since 1990. Uh, I was working um, very close to where the farm is located um, in this um, resort, okay, where, where we also have the hot springs I was speaking to you about earlier. And um, I, I was there for about even a even little more than 10 years, and I had a lot of time to go around, you know, because um, I, I, I was based in Milan, but I was here three or four days a week. And uh, you know, when you are on a, on a working leave, then, then you finish work. And uh, I kind of uh, drove around and I got to know this place very well. And um, I, I noticed that in spite of this absolutely unique conditions, nobody was producing in a sustainable way. It seemed like um, local people weren't aware of this treasure uh, somehow. They, they did, just didn't see it and they were producing wine in a very, you know, industrial, conventional, like any other place uh, without um, noticing they, they maybe could do something a little bit different and that in, in order to, um, uh, of course, um, I mean, uh, use you know this this the, the great value of this of this biodiversity that i was telling you about and so i looked for the land that was suitable for my project it took me a few years um uh, but finally you know i i, I could find the place that uh, i thought was, was good for my project and also what was important um i found this old vineyard that was on this land it's a vineyard that now is about 60 years old and, wow. and this was yeah and and this was um very important because it gave me the indications of what varieties were historical from here okay so what was planted there what what grapes were planted in that vineyard so it's basically the the grapes we are cultivating that and that we also planted in the new vineyard so in the whites we have this procanico no, it's a difficult name. This, this is a very rare grape that uh, is originated from the town of Pitigliano. So volcanic soils we're speaking about. Uh, and, and this is a, is a grape that was abandoned for some decades because of the lower yields compared to Trebbiano. Trebbiano is the most popular Italian white grape. It's, it's very popular because of the very big bunches, you know, you can produce a lot of quantity and, and for some time uh, in the world, uh, not just Italy, people were just concerned about producing a lot, you know, and uh, um, so the, this Procanico was in this area was abandoned, the old vineyards were abandoned and, and they planted um, Trebbiano. So okay, I was so stop you right there for a half a second and ask everybody to go ahead and pour a little bit of their wine if they have the uh, Bianco. And this is our orange wine today, and it is made with Procanico grape. So yeah. uh, we're gonna get to some and of the other also, also some Trebbiano. And uh, this one is, is a blend actually because I have What's this. Your percentage? How much of it is Procanico? How much of it is Trebbiano? I, I would say this is about uh, 60, 40. Okay. It's, it's not fixed, depends on, on the vintage. Yeah. But when you found the land and you started your winery, what, what year was that? Uh, the, the land I found in uh, 2009. Okay. And, and we make, I, I would say, 
Um, my my first, you know, it, it was just a small vineyard I had at the time. Uh, so it was a, maybe, I don't know, I produced maybe a thousand bottles. And um, what was the year of the first harvest? 20, 2010. Okay. Well, we, ha we had a trial harvest in, uh, in uh, 2009, but it was just, you know, to understand what was happening with those grapes. Right. We, we right. didn't um, commercialize anything. <laughs> Um, and then, so I would say my first very small production was in 2010. Okay, so before we dive in too much, people can taste this. This is an orange wine. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but I want to make sure everyone understands that your expertise and how you um, make your wines is, is natural wine. And when I interviewed you the first time, you made a comment to me. You said, if you use chemicals in the vineyard, then you have to intervene in the winery. So I understand that natural wine, in your mind, is absolutely no intervention or little intervention as possible in the vineyard. Is that correct? Yes, I would say low intervention because it's not possible to make no intervention. Right. Of course, you need to do something, okay? Right. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> But um, we, we don't use any kind of, of chemical at all. Uh, so, um, or we don't irrigate, for instance. So okay. another thing, very important. And also um, we let the vines grow in three dimensions. So you, you, really? you come to see our vineyards. They're not, you know, the narrow row, like, like you see like this. Okay. So, they, they it's a can, little bit like uh, the, the picture you see here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they, they can grow like a little tree, okay? So yeah. because this is by respecting their physiology of, of the vine, um, we are able to do less, okay? So uh, we need to create the conditions in order to do less. Okay. Uh, and, and the conditions are, for instance, you know, of course, the place I was speaking about, you have, need to have a suitable climate. You need to use um, varieties that are very adapted to this place, which we are doing because we are using the historical varieties. Original, of the place. right? Uh, and and you also need to let um, you know the plants uh, to respect their physiology, and so they 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 can grow in a, in a more healthy way. Okay, this this is kind of a. I'm generalizing a lot, uh, I'm telling right. you. Well, and actually there is a methodology that you created with Lorenzo Carino, and yeah. it is actually called the Carino Method. So I want everybody to be aware that, that um, Antonella is partly responsible for a methodology for natural wine created in Italy called the Carino Method. So all of these certain specifications are in this met methodology, is that right? Yeah. What I'm telling you uh, about is, is uh, a lot of the okay. things that are inside, of course. Um, okay. Yes. So, so uh, all of our, I would say, all of this process that is described by the Metodo Corino is, um, we, we do all these things, which is quite complex, okay? Um, because we want to achieve grapes with thick skin, this is very important. So very healthy uh, grapes with thick skin. This is important to make natural wine. Okay. okay. So, so all Why is that important? Uh, we, we aim to achieve this kind of grape. And with this kind of grapes, we are able to uh, actually um, not add anything in the, in the cellar and then use the indigenous yeasts that are on the on the skin, you know, that's perfect. Oh. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So we are all tasting your orange wine. And um, as a sommelier, I have been around people, uh, lots of people. And on my experience, and this is just my personal experience, is either you love, love, love orange wines or you don't like them at all. <laughs> I haven't found a lot of people that are either that are sort of like, yeah, they're okay. Either you love them or you don't like them. And I personally just had a glass of this out on the dock and it was the perfect pairing for this beautiful, sunny blue sky day. Uh, it's like sunshine in a glass. 
And if you could, while we're sipping this, we're gonna have everybody comment in just a minute, but what is the deal with orange wine? We, you know, for somebody that's never heard of mm -hmm. orange wine, what is orange wine? So why do we have orange wine? And I made a post this afternoon and I said, yes, I'm drinking orange wine on National Rosé Day. <laughs> because <I'm laughs> tasting. So, so can you just quickly explain what's the deal with orange wine? Why do we have orange wine? Okay, as, a, as an Italian, I don't like very much this, this way of calling these wines orange wine, because when you say orange wine, everybody starts to think about Slovenia and these places, and then people ask me, you know, I get these questions, why are you making wine like them? No, it's not, it's not like that at all, because all wines in the world, all white, uh, all wines from white... <laughs> varieties in the world were like this before technology in the cellar okay so this is just a traditional way to make wine um i, I like to call these wines you know um fermented with the skins this this is what Perfect. i say when when they ask me because this is what it is we are fermenting uh even the white grapes the same way uh, that we do the the red grapes uh, and in this way, of course, since the character of the wine, you know very well, is in the skin, okay, it's not in the pulp, which is basically just fiber and, and sugar and, and water. Um, in, in this way, we can uh, extract, you know, the, the, the true char character of this, of this variety, um, which, of course, uh, this is also one of our aims as, as a winery, to express the place, to, to really express in, in our wines, you know, you may like them or not like them, uh, it's according to taste, but they are original products that really express this place. So we, we, this is what we want to achieve. So if, if you drink, say, a Chile Giolo uh, from La Maliosa, it's a true expression of this variety into this from the place of origin of the Chile Giolo. Perfect. So, Perfect. so th this is it, you know, you want to know about Chile Giolo, I'm quite sure if you drink our Chile Giolo, you get a very true expression. So, so, um, so um, in this example, how long did you have this, the grapes um, on the skins when you were fermenting? We go from three to four weeks. It's not, okay. it's, you know, it also depends, of course, on the vintage because, uh, you know, every, every vintage is a little bit different. So it really depends uh, actually on, on the actual grapes that are coming into the cellar. But I would say three to four weeks. Uh, in this example here, I, I have the 2019 vintage. I think it's the one you have. Yeah, that's what I have. Uh, so it's, it's closer to four, uh, to four weeks than three weeks. Uh, okay. the, the 2018 was a little bit um, shorter, I remember. So it's probably more around the three weeks. Yeah. I have one question before I get comments. Um, I, I, do you in the vineyard, I know you're organic biodynamic, vegan, all that, am I right? Practice well, we're not we're not a certified Steiner, uh, the, you know, Demeter biodynamic. We say okay. biodynamic to, just to, <laughs> to make people understand that we work in a, in a closed cycle uh, right. agriculture. Okay, but we 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 as far as the certification, we have just the organic. Okay, and you let the vines grow big, but do you believe in leaf pulling? and things uh, dropping fruit at all? Do you do those traditional things some other winemakers do? If the grapes can't get enough sun, they pull leaves off the vines. Do you do any of that? Well, of course we, we yes. Yeah, and now the technical um, way to say it in English, and I don't know, but yes, of course we, 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 we take out the ex excess, uh, you know, okay. leaves or uh, before, before harvest. Um, but we don't, uh, what we don't do is we don't take, you know, cut off excess bunches. Okay. Because Good. we take, we take them out before. Okay. Okay. We, we want the plant 
to put all the energy into those bunches and not to have so many bunches that we have to take up because you know uh, if you have too many bunches you're losing quality if you have too many bunches on on a plant then you can, you can take them out but still the the plant has been working with a lot of bunches so it's been distributing you know okay perfect so we we, cool. we do this work now we're doing it now to go around the vineyards and take out you know except what is it in okay so you do it now before there's any raison yeah okay Okay, so I love this wine. Um, I get really pretty notes of um, peach and peach pit and um, like a lemon curd. There's some tannin on it, obviously, from the skins. Uh, the acidity is lower on this wine. Um, I love the nuttiness and the almost uh, brioche style, uh, crusty bread, that kind of note. Uh, but I'm gonna add, open it up and get some uh, comments from Burley's group. All right, yeah, we're actually drinking uh, the 2018 vintage. Um, so, you know, this has a little more age on it. Um, and I think as far as the fruit goes, um, the fruit is not as pronounced on this one, but you know, what I'm getting is more of the nuttiness, almost like almonds or marzipan, Definitely getting some lemon on this one as well, uh, and almonds. So just, you know, I, I would agree with like the nuttiness, Paul, kind of the brioche. Um, and as I was pouring this one, you know, I noticed that, you know, this also has sediment. So maybe this is a question. Um, is this made to be, uh, would you, uh, decant this one, or do you think it's better just to have it, you know, in its natural state? Personally, I don't see any reason to decant it. Maybe Antonella feels differently, but I just pour carefully. I think that that uh, sediment in a white wine, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Just don't drink the last sip. Oh no, no, I didn't pour. I didn't pour the sediment. But as far as uh, you know, obviously we're not going to finish the whole thing, uh, Antonella. Do you, do you recommend? Yes, I can. I cannot hear you very well. What What was oh. the question? Oh, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I was saying, as far as storing this, um, overnight, you know, two to three days. Do you recommend uh, decanting this at all, or just keeping it on the sediments? Um. Mm, okay, there, 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 always, there is always some sediment because we don't filter, but it doesn't um, influence the wine in any particular way. So it's, it's not a problem. Uh, just be careful, you know, to pour it a little bit gently so the sediment can, be, can stay on the bottom of the bottle. Um, just in general, what I think about natural wines and especially also my wines, La Maliosa wines, uh, I think they are, uh, you know, they, they need a lot of, um, they, they need to meet the oxygen, okay? So it's good to open them. It's not always possible. I understand this, but if you are at home, uh, it's nice to open them maybe half an hour before you're going to drink them. It's not necessary to decant, but maybe what you want to do is to leave it in, in your glass for 10 minutes, uh, because in this way you can appreciate how it evolves. It evolves quite quickly in the glass. Uh, my personal preference for these wines is the next day. The next day that you are opening them is, is their best expression. To me, I mean, you, you can try it and then you can decide for yourself. I don't think it's going to make it, Antonella. <laughs> I don't think the bottle stands a chance. <laughs> One of my friends here said that uh, she gets uh, olives on this one. Oh, yeah. 2018 vintage. I yeah. bet. Yes, yeah, so there's definitely a little brininess. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, like, I like that. So I'm going to move us along. We're going to pour some of the uh, Saturnio Rosa. And just for the record, the Rosa wine from La Maliosa, I bought uh, on several occasions from Sheila. And it's one of my favorite wines that she has, Antonella. Um, 
the regular Rosso. I have not tasted this Saturnia Rosa. So just so we have an idea, first of all, what grape variety is this? The Saturnia. Um, the Saturnia uh, is, a, is a blend of our uh, red, of all our red varieties, basically. Um, so the, the percentage changes a little bit every vintage because it's depending on, on what we harvest. Uh, I would say there is a majority of Sangiovese in the 2019, and then we have Chile Giolo and the Grey Canonao. Um, the, the way it's made, uh, I would say, uh, well, well say, same as we just spoke about for, uh, for the Saturnia Bianco. Um, we bottle this wine usually before the next harvest. So usually say the 19 was bottled around uh, August or, or beginning of September, I would say. So how much time does it spend in wood? Is it in wood at all or concrete? Yes, it's, it's wood. We, we All our fermentations for the red wines take place into concrete and then uh, go into the very big barrel, um, you know, the, the 20, 25 uh, hectoliters. So um, uh, this is for the red wines. Uh, the white wines, the fermentation takes place in wood. So they stay in wood all the time. Big, okay. big, uh, big barrels. Is it, is, is it aged in wood? Is this wine, the red, aged in wood for long or is... No, not like really because because this this is a wine that is good young. It's a simple wine, okay. is, is an easy to drink wine, doesn't have a lot of tannin, you know, so it's... Um, is I, I think uh, here in Italy we have this thing called aperitivo, which is when you have a drink before dinner. Before and uh, it, it's very, it's very nice for 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 this kind of occasions, you know, right. easy, easy, casual occasions. It's not a wine that you have to really study to understand. You know, you just drink right. it and just you enjoy it. it. I think is good. Well, yeah. what is the difference between the Rosso that Sheila sells and the Saturnia Rosso? Uh, yes, the Rosso is just Ciliegiolo. Almost, uh, I would say about 95% Chile Giolo and, and the rest uh, um, is, is Sangiovese, I would say mainly. Uh, so uh, it, the, it's, that, that, that's what it is, you know, the variety. The variety. And that's what we're and looking at. This mm. slide here shows Chile Giolo. <laughs> So oh, here's our wine here. This is the wine we're drinking. And I just want to say the nose on this is spectacular. I'm getting a lot of um, perfume like notes and rose petal. Um, there's berries, but I love the elegance and um, yeah, there's, there's, it's just very fragrant, but it's more along the lines of rose petal and um, maybe a dried rose petal um, and uh, maybe dried figs. It's just beautiful. Does anybody have any comments on your end, Burley? Yeah, we love it. Um, beautiful. I mean, these guys have lips so they can, they can chime in as well. <laughs> but what they whisper to me is, uh, yeah, they definitely found it to be very aromatic, and they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you what they think now. I, I have. I know that my the aroma is like almost like licorice, which is it's just it's very red licorice. Red, red licorice. Okay, and yes. then Nina, Nina also picked up on. What was your first uh, impression, Nina? Well, I can't quite say like what flavors I'm tasting, like the specific notes, but I do like the lightness of it. And I like the way that it like falls, <laughs> you know, like, like the, the aftertaste. Okay, like a that. long finish, lingering finish. And also I'm picking up on a bit of spiciness to it. So very elegant, very beautiful. 
I'm still going back with my, I love that, right? That dry, dry rose petal is just killing it right now. It's beautiful. Yes. I'm getting some, um, on the finish, I'm getting some um, orange peel, um, maybe a little tomato leaf. It's not really vegetal in any way, but there is an herbal quality to it. Yes. And uh, the, the soil, the volcanic soil is coming through on the finish as well. It's a little earthy. But definitely both of these wines make you want more. So that's a good thing. That's what you want. <laughs> yeah, we actually have food. So, you know, we, uh, I was asked if we should, you know, pair anything up. I said to wait, but definitely by the end of this, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna taste uh, the food uh, with the wine too. There you go. Okay, well, I would like to comment on one thing that Burley was saying earlier about, about the Bianco. Actually, she, she mentioned uh, um, almond. And I would like to say, did any of you uh, taste any, any, a little bit like honey, you know, a little bit of a smell of honey in the Bianco? Because these are, are specific characters for uh, Procanico. So the, the, the honey that is, is coming quite early, uh, you know, when you open the bottle. And then, uh, and then you also have this, um, Actually, like, like I didn't get it when I opened it, but it's opening up now and I'm getting the honey now or a honeycomb. Yeah. yeah. So th that's very typical of Procanico. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, I don't have anything else about the wine. I don't know if anybody has any more questions about the wine, Sheila. No, no, I, I don't know. Well, um, Helen, uh, do you have, do you have the wines with you by chance? I have the wines, but I'm not drinking them right now, but I've, I've had them, th these vintages and the olive oil on a regular basis, especially the olive oil. I actually, on the white wine, I, it really was exactly what Ruth was saying, you know, Antonella waiting a while, honeyness. I actually got a little bit of that candied fruit and some ginger, but not fresh ginger, dried ginger. Um, and also I really, I, I really like the tannins in it. The tannins are just superb. So I can see why you like to drink it the next day. Cause I've had the, a little bit left in the bottle and it's pretty good the next day. Yo, can, can I tell you, can I tell you a little bit of a story about this wine? <laughs> it's very quick. I, I, um, I went to a tasting um a few years ago uh and, and it was a tasting of all conventional wines and we had this very important sommelier you know and journalists and everybody is uh, it was in barolo so you know it was it was all quite serious um and i presented this wine because it was a tasting about rare grapes uh so i presented this wine and and they they tasted it and then I said, you know, if, if you have the patience, because after, you know, my turn, there was, I don't know how many other uh, ladies, uh, it was about uh, women producers. So there was a lot of ladies presenting their wines. And I said, you know, just, you know, leave some wine in your glass and then you taste it again after, uh, you know, the event is finished. And so that was it. And apparently nobody did this except for one lady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, this one Chinese lady. Okay. And she came, uh, I was there with um, Professor Corino and uh, she came to meet us after the tasting and we had a chat and she actually said, you know, you know, I did what you uh, suggested. And then she was uh, completely blown away by the evolution of this wine. Because what is nice about the Bianco, if you leave it there maybe an hour, <laughs> you can make this experiment, then you will have a, a completely different expression and you will have all the botanicals that come out. So mm -hmm. it's no more honey, but all the botanicals. And what is amazing is what, you know, the, all the botanicals that I smell in the glass, it's what I can smell in the vineyard during the summer. I can guarantee you it's the same. I mean, it's amazing. I don't I know how it. this can happen, but it happens. 
And, and so what, what happened with this lady? Well, uh, a couple of years later, she uh, became the first natural wine importer in China. <laughs> and she called me, so I am now exporting in China through this lady. And, and all, all thanks to the suggestion to, you know, leave the wine in the glass. <laughs> That's so, fantastic. So, you, you know, Antonella, there was a grape uh, in a wine that I used to sell many years ago uh, from Calabria. Um, and the grape was Mantonico, which is a uh, white grape. And this has similar characteristics to that. Um, was it was it also a fermentation with the skins? This yes, wine? And yes, and it and it's uh, and it aged really well. Um, but I'd have to go back and look at some of my notes. But I, I happen to like Procanico. I've had it before. Um, some other producers uh, that I know have used it, but again, it, not a hundred percent. It's always in a blend. Um, you know, you actually use a high percentage of it. Uh, yeah. Well, I have another wine that is 100%. Wow. It's actually my top, it's my top wine of the winery. Okay. I make very few bottles. Uh, I only make about uh, from a thousand to 1500 bottles, depending yeah. on the vintage. Um, and and that that's a really really amazing wine. It's completely my favorite wine. Definitely, it's my wine of the heart. How we as we say here in Italy. Well, I'll have to come and try it in one of your star boxes. <laughs> definitely, that's it. Come to taste it in the star box. Even if you don't like the wine, you you can see you know the the sunset, and you would be in peace with yourself. <laughs> Exactly. We all need a visit to a Starbucks. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, do we want to move to the uh, olive oil? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's like itching to taste and to learn more. Um, I'm actually going to switch places with my friend to be a little closer uh, to my computer. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm definitely more of an expert on wine um, as opposed to olive oil, but I definitely, uh, you know, accept the challenge uh, because <laughs> we are going to taste uh, two of your olive oils, and I'm not sure if you want to maybe provide, you know, the technical information, but I have two of them here. I have your, um, your Aurinia. Caletra. Ah, okay. that's Aurinia. Okay. Aurinia. Okay. And then I also have your 2020. Okay. As we just learned, Caletra. Calet Caletra. Yes. Caletra. So, um, so basically what I have here is I'm just going to put up some things that I thought would pair nicely with these two. Um, and basically my understanding is that the Arena is a little more, uh, maybe not as complex. Is that correct? Would that, would that be, well, uh, that, I mean, if I have to compare the two? Yeah, I, I would say the Arena is your typical Tuscan blend. Okay. okay, because it's made in the same percentages and same varieties that is used in the um, I, IGT is calling the, you know, the um, denomination for, there's also a denomination for, for appellation for the, for the olive oil, for Tuscan olive oil. Um, so I, I split, basically made that way. So you're typical, which, um, Oddio, uh, dimmi amaro in inglese che mi scappa la parola. Amaro. Mm, bitter. Uh, bitter. 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 Okay, so uh, you have the bitter that is quite strong in the, in the Aurinia. Uh, and uh, and uh, I would say a little bit less of the spicy. Uh, wh why am I mentioning the bitter and the spicy? Because 
these are the two um, quality indicators for extra virgin olive oils. So a lot of times people uh, taste the bitter and they say, oh, it's not good, you know, because they're used to supermarket olive oils that are basically, even though it says extra virgin, they are not basically. <laughs> and they taste a little bit like sweet, you know, and when, when it's sweet, you can be sure it's not extra virgin. This is really, it, these are two very important indicators. How do they change? Well, of course, they change like wine according to vintage, according to varieties, which in olive oil they're called cultivar. Uh, but basically, what it means is variety. Um, and uh, so, like I was saying, the Aurinia, you can pair it with, uh, you know, grilled meat, uh, with the Tuscan cuisine, you know, so uh, the soups, bean soups um the red meat grilled meat uh so so uh, you you need to have food that is quite tasty in order to pair it with this olive oil uh the other which is caletra is a single variety it's called lecho del corno i would say is the, it's the sister of the, of the Procanico in the way that it's a rare cultivar um, that we found in, in, on this land. Uh, we found a few trees of this, of this uh, and we replanted it. It was an experiment <laughs> which succeeded very well because I, I need to tell you this olive oil from the first year we produced it has always won like top olive oil in this, uh, in, in, in basically all the contests with, that we presented and especially uh, we have the most important contest for organic olive oil in the world is called Biol and it takes place in Italy and it's an international, they're always winning top prize. And this year we are very happy because for the first time we won like the, the top um, of, of all uh, <laughs> prizes, which is the three leaves of the Gambero Rosso. Maybe, I don't know if in the United States, you know, Gambero Rosso, but anyway, it's quite... Yeah, they do uh, it for wine. Absolutely. Okay. okay. They also have this for olive oil. And, and so this year we got the three leaves. So we are really in the... You can, you can consider this Caletra as really one of the top organic olive oils in the world. I mean, there is absolutely... And it's quite different from the Aurinia because... Um, it's more elegant, has a lot of perfume, um, it, and it's, but it's more delicate on the food. So what it does, you can, you can pair it with uh, um, raw vegetables, with salads, white meat. Um, it's nice because our two olive oils have a quite a different uh, expression and also they can be paired with different, in a different way. Okay, so they're not overlapping. Um, usually the caletra is more on the spicy side. Uh, you, you can get a little bit more of the spice. This is, this is really typical of the lecho del corno, which is this variety. I mean, I could, I could speak for like another half an hour if you want, I but I think I, I need to stop at one point. So <laughs> you no, tell me. Everything yeah. you're saying because what I'm going to say is not going to be as technical. <laughs> <laughs> but what I put together here, um, I don't know if you guys can see my plate, and maybe in Italy you would laugh at this plate because it's kind of, you know, what Americans assume is, you know, Tuscan or Italian um, cuisine. But for the Orinia, the first thing that I prepare here is just a simple, not so much a salad, but just uh, caprese. Uh, tomatoes with a little bit of mozzarella and olive oil and some herbs. Now, I know you said, you know, this should be hearty food, right? Some meat, something with a lot of flavor. So it's not quite that, but, you but know. But that's I good because, because, you know, you can taste more of the olive oil. The olive oil is going to cover a okay. little bit of the taste of the food, but it's a very good olive oil, so you can be happy if okay. you can taste the olive oil. Okay, so we're going to try the first one, uh, like I said, with the uh, 
Campari tomatoes and the mozzarella and the herb. And I would agree, right? Like since this is so basic, we should really get most of the flavor of the olive oil. Hmm. What do you guys think? Okay, so we have three thumbs up, okay, as opposed to just two. <laughs> I, I didn't give a thumbs up. Okay. Um, and the other thing I guess would be kind of cliche because right in America, we tend to put olive oil on olives. <laughs> so maybe we will skip that, okay, in order, you know, to compare. But what I also have is just basic Italian bread. So I'm also going to drizzle a little bit of the olive oil on the bread. Um, in addition to that, I also have a simple salad here with um, greens and mixed herbs, but uh, I'm going to wait and I'm going to try the other one, the uh, the calitra with the mixed greens. So I guess olive oil and bread, would you say is kind of a classic? Yeah, of pairing? course. Uh, it's nicer if you can have a warm bread because in that way the perfume is really going to become more full, you know, and, uh, and, yes. you can, and really appreciate it more. And I actually did toast the bread, but obviously we've been on the call now for a while. So the bread is not quite as warm as it was, but I think, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's still going to stand up. So I'm basically just going to drizzle some of the olive oil, but maybe uh, Antonella. Can you tell us really the best way to taste the oil as opposed to just putting everything on the food and then, yeah. uh, you know, deciding? Well, uh, if you want, uh, I can describe maybe in, in a very simple way uh, what a professional tasting of olive oil, how you do it. Well, you, you can put it in a, in a small glass, if you have a small glass, transparent in glass okay, or on. I'm actually going to get little shot glasses so we can okay as, as long as it's transparent and, and then you can see the oil okay uh, or you can also use cups simple mm, espresso cups you know plastic that that's that's okay also if you don't have the, the glass and you you pour uh, you pour. Let's say I take I take just a little glass so I can show you. Yeah, I'm pouring like one ounce, one ounce. Okay, for each person. Mm. Okay, I'll I'll do it with the oil, right? Sure. So it's easier to see. This is not an actual professional taste of glass. It's just a glass. <laughs> anyway, I don't have it here. I'm at home now, of course. Okay, so you put it in your hand like this and you put the other hand over it like this. So you need to warm it up. You cannot taste olive oil cold because you're gonna lose all the, all the nose basically. So you, you need to warm up your glass. Uh, of course, you don't need to, to warm. So you can just turn it like this in order to warm it up faster. Uh, you don't need to, to be there a long time if you have a plastic cup. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like wine, right? Okay. So, okay, so uh, you take a little sniff and put it back again. Okay, now let your hand, your, your hand needs to be over the glass because you need to concentrate the, the smells, okay? You need to, the perfumes, you need to, Leave it there. Okay. Don't lift it. Okay. And you just lift it just enough so you can smell and then down again. Okay. Wow. Okay. Okay. Now, now you can really smell, right? Yes. Okay. What could you smell? Um, I can definitely pick up on the aroma more. Um, this one, um, almost like the leaves of the olive. Okay, before, before, nothing complicated. I tell you one simple rule, okay, to understand olive oil, you don't need to be an olive oil sommelier. You need to be able to smell the olive. This is, I mean, a must, all right? 
And if you go on a supermarket and you take some bottles off the shelf, you almost never will be able to smell the olive. So, you know, first thing, can you smell the olive? I hope so. I'm glad that you said that because I didn't want to say that I smell olive. <laughs> All right. so, this is very good. This is I the sign you of say, well, duh. <laughs> like, of okay. course, I smell olives because it's olive oil, but I do. I do okay. smell this olives. Is <laughs> it's not obvious that you will be able to smell the olive. So th this yes. is very important, but it's also very simple. If if consumers, you know, were taught this simple rule, they would be able to understand a lot about uh, extra virgin olive oil. But uh, apparently, nobody's telling them. You know. So anyway, we're not even uh, taught to smell olive oil at all. We're just taught. We're not really taught anything about right. olive oil other than. We may know the term Ivu, okay? Everybody here, you guys know what Ivu is? Extra virgin olive oil, and that's kind of become like a trendy thing. But other than that, we don't really, you know, if it doesn't say extra virgin or organic, I would say the average American probably doesn't really, um, you know, that's about all uh, we know. Okay. You, you can have organic and not be extra virgin, by the way, eh? because okay. if, it, if it has a defect, it won't be extra virgin, but assume, let's assume. So organic is not a guarantee for absence of faults. Okay. Uh, um, anyways, so after you do this the first time, th then you got your olive, you put your hand back, you leave it there just another maybe minute or so, and then you can again smell this time, trying to get the secondary um, smells or secondary uh, perfumes, right? So, Sheila, do you have the, the um, graph for Aurinia? Because that's very easy to explain. If you put it on the screen, then, then they can smell and also understand sure, what yeah. you're talking about. I do. This one here? Yeah, put it more in the center of the screen because I, I don't know if it's me, but I don't see it. No, it's me. Okay, there. So um, when you have an extra virgin olive oil here in Italy, it has to go in order to be um, certified extra virgin, it has to go through a panel of tasters or professional tasters and they come up with this kind of graph that um, exactly describes the secondary um, taste and, and perfume you know, of, of, the, of this olive oil. So for the Aurinia, we have, uh, so after the olive, what you want to know is, is the fruttato. So the amount of olive that you can smell, how much can you smell? So if it can be, a delicate olive oil, you have less and medium and strong. In this case, the aurinia, the fruttato, meaning the, the, the olive, you know, that you can, you can feel is, is quite a lot, it's quite high. So we can say uh, this is a fruttato intenso. See, it says on the bottom, it's in Italian. You see that value 6.3, it has a lot of olive. You can smell a lot of the olive. So it's, a, it's an intense olive uh, that is described. There are three categories, uh, light, medium, and intense. These are three um, official categories for extra virgin. In this case, we have an intense. There's a lot of it, all right? And then um, we have also, uh, all the others are typical ex basic expressions of, of the extra virgin. You have the artichoke, you have the almond, mm -hmm. you have green meaning, meaning uh, grass, basically. <laughs> so it's, it can be um, il, il fieno, come si dice il fieno? Uh, I think it's hay. No. Hay. Right, mm -hmm. so it's, it's grass in, in various expression. It, it can be green hay, dry hay or whatever. Uh, what, what do you have on the right side? I can't read. Um, picante. Because uh, picante is the spicy. Yes. And then you have the bitter. So yes. these are official characters for extra virgin olive oils. 
and with this kind of graph, it, it, every single uh, olive oil can be described exactly. So in this case, we have uh, an intense fruit. Uh, we have quite uh, um, light uh, expression of the artichoke and the almond, but we have a lot of bitter and, uh, and, uh, and spicy. Okay, so this is just a description of the character like you would do uh, for wine, yes. but for olive oil is simpler because um, you have something in different in a different measure, but you're evaluating basically uh, the same characters, okay, in, in different uh, values. In wine, you can have, I mean, so many more descriptors uh, than, yeah. than olive oil. However, these are, are, are uh, important to know because they give you a framework th that you can work on while you are tasting. Okay, can I tell you what I'm tasting in this one? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I would definitely say it's very, it's balanced. So you were mm -hmm. saying a lot of Amaro, but for me, it's fruity as well as Honestly, I don't even really get a lot of the bitterness. And just the, the simple white Tuscan bread, I mean, I feel like brings out a lot of the flavors. Uh, you mentioned artichoke, I'm getting that as a note. And then um, sage, which is interesting. You were talking about maybe kind of the herbs and the grassiness, I'm picking up on a herbal note, but sage is really coming through. Mm -hmm. and um there's like a butteriness to it almost so i know this is not the delicate one but uh i think it's it's, it's very nice it has a nice mouth feel to it and it's flavorful um uh, again i feel like the bread i mean just just brought out uh the flavors even mm -hmm. more well okay, of course yeah. when you when you pair it you will uh you know so, some some of the of the characters will be more or less balanced depending on what you are pairing it with. Yeah, we're, we're all saying there's a butteriness to this one. So yeah. honestly, I can't wait to try the Kalitra because if this is kind of the intro one, uh, mm -hmm. this is definitely very nice. Um, so shall we talk about the next one or do you want to maybe talk about the technical aspects this one I actually did put in a little container. So we'll be able to go through the exercise uh, that you just taught yes. us even better. Um, I know this is gonna sound like a silly question, but um, I've been to um, places where people actually drink a little bit of the olive oil. Is that something that you would typically do in a tasting? No, uh, there, there is, there is, there is a, a way uh, I'm going to show you. Just bear with me. I have to take the dog inside because it's... Oh, no, no problem at all. Uh, this gives us time to eat. <laughs> but you know what we also want to do maybe while Antonella is away? Since we do have the wine, uh, I would actually like to try some of the wine with uh, some of the food that has the olive oil. So if you guys can bear with us, I don't know if everybody has the olive oil with it, but I'm just going to do the same test, dipping a little bit of the bread in the olive oil. And then I, I want to try it with the uh, Saturnia Bianco, because I felt like that particular wine had a lot of those olive notes to it. Uh, Not bad, complimentary. I 
I feel like I need something different though, not just the bread <laughs> with the uh, uh, Saturnia. Okay, so you're back. Okay. Um... Yeah, so I mean, there's nothing wrong with with uh, drinking the olive oil. I mean, it's good for you. So it, this in, uh, so if you enjoy drinking, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, as far as the tasting, this is what you need to do. Can you see me? Because I can't see my. Yeah, face can you see me? Can you see us? Uh, I can. I can see yeah, you. Yeah, we have you. We you have see me? So we can see. Okay. You. Oh, that's a much better. So, so once you get the smell, then you need to taste it, right? We just spoke about smelling. <laughs> so now you have your little glass and you're going to do, um, uh, in Italian, it's called strippaggio, which uh, I don't know what would the translation of that would be, but anyway, it's something like this. I would need to spit now, but I'm not spitting. I would have to spit actually. So you are uh, making it very little drops going around all of your mouth everywhere. So you wow. can taste everything, okay? All, all kinds of, uh, from all the areas of your tongue. And uh, um, so this is the, so you are taking air together with the with the oil and then you're you need to spit the oil because you don't want the oil to go into your throat so you go oh. like, oh. in the air like this you can try it with me i know it's not okay, the very yeah. nice uh, time, but anyway okay. uh, shall we try guys All right <laughs> we're going to attempt i don't i can't promise that i'm not going to get the olive oil if in you open your mouth like that and go take in the air okay that's it that's the way <laughs> No, but it has to make a lot of noise. Otherwise, you're not taking enough air. You know, because it's very, it's very effective, actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can really taste the flavors on this one. This one is right, a lot because it goes all around in very little droplets. So yeah. This is what's important. It's, it's not just going, like, when you're drinking, it goes down like this, and yeah. it doesn't go around. It needs to go around. Yeah. Um, it's very... This one is a lot more intense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I don't want to say that it's spicy, but I feel like the herb. No, but it is. Good. It's more oh. spicy, actually. It's yeah. more spicy. Yes. Yeah, it's very intense. Yeah. Um, so, as far as the spice goes, how would you describe it? Because it's not so much like a peppery note as opposed to, to me, almost like. A concentration of herbs. Well, the spice is one thing, and then you also have the herbs. I think here you're more maybe on on the dry herbs. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, I'm getting like rosemary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Rosemary. Mm -hmm. uh, the the, sp the spice you can yes. you can feel it as as like a tingling uh, near the throat. Yes. That, that's what we mean by, by spice. Um, so in sometimes, not now, okay, but in some uh, vintages, uh, you can also get a note of like a green tomato a little bit. I can't, I can't uh, um, feel it so much here. I can... Yeah. Uh, uh, I can uh, taste more of the um, almond. Yeah. I, I mean, I know you said this one is a little more delicate. Yeah. But I feel like maybe because it's a newer vintage, it's a lot more intense, actually. And I feel like it's a little spicier. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Usually the, the spice is this in, a, in an extra virgin olive oil is more associated with elegance than the bitter. Yes. So uh, well, this is the uh, character of the variety. The Lecce del Corno gives you more spice. Okay. okay. And can you uh, talk about the cultivars with this one? I know this one is a mono cultivar. Right, so it's just one and it's called Lecce del Corno and, and the typical expression of this variety is the spice. 
So you will always get more spice than bitter in this uh, in this kind of olive oil. Yeah. Now mm. I, I don't know if it would be proper to say, but I feel like this has a long finish on it. Like yeah. it's really, it's absolutely no, it's 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 definitely uh, true. Yes. Uh, I, I'm friends with a very, very uh, important sommelier, olive oil sommelier in Italy, and she's basically the, the you know, most important authority in tasting olive oil. And uh, she explained to me, and I think it is true because she knows I, I'm always sending her my olive oils to taste. And uh, she told me that the caletra is very complex on the nose and this a lot more than the other olive oil. And actually this is a very nice thing about caletra. Uh, so when you taste, you will get a little bit of the spice and it's going to um, go, you know, doesn't overcome the food but it will, um, especially with the warm food, you will get a lot of complexity on the nose from this olive oil. It's very nice to smell it when you pour it on a, on a warm um, and, and dish, you know, and uh, to enjoy how it, 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 it melts with the, with the smell of the food and comes out with all the complexity on, on the nose. Okay, so as far as a pairing goes, um, I think I heard you say that just drizzling this over, over a nice salad uh, would you yes, uh, the, uh, steamed vegetables, okay. raw vegetables, fish. Okay. Um, I had it on um, a steak tonight. It was really good. Oh, mm. interesting. Okay, so, all right. Well, I, I, I'm going to stick to just a simple mixed green salad here with herbs with a little bit of lemon juice and <laughs> salt and pepper. And I feel like that is so basic. Do you think that's going to do it justice at all? Yeah, yeah. But you know, I mean, it, these are good olive oils. You, you don't need to be an olive oil sommelier to enjoy this kind of olive oils. I mean, right. you, you are totally right to use it the way you want. I mean, um, if, you, if you want to have fun, I think yeah. um, you can try to have some pairing just as, as like a fun game. <laughs> In Italy, people have tried, um, have started to pair very good olive oils with um, seasoned cheeses. Oh, nice. Like, like the pecorino, like the parmigiano. Uh, they, they pair, which is not an intuitive way to use olive oil, but I think it's quite interesting, in fact. I'm glad. Antonella, it's great on the, um, and you've seen, I've used it before on the pecorino with fava and lemon. Yes. Uh, and I also love making, I've done it many times already because the citrus this year has been beautiful, but mixing different oranges, blood orange, regular, cara cara, grape, all these different oranges with some olive oil and fennel and toss it. It's just delicious. It just yeah. it's so yeah on fruits, right? On on uh, uh, totally, yeah. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, citrus uh, fruit, whatever. The yeah. pepper, the pepper. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so we we just had a, a comment from Cheryl about uh, the benefits to um, to your health with olive oil and. Um, and not that a, I'm not an expert at all, but um, but I think polyphenols have a, an influence um, yes. on, on the health impacts, right, Antonella? Yes. Well, well, Sheila has the, has the analysis. I think you you have the analysis of both of these of these olive oils, and we the the polyphenol content is is really. Um, skyrocketing polyphenols on these olive oils, uh, especially the Caletra. Uh, I think it was over 1,000 per... Uh, just to give you, just to give you a measure. How, how much was it, Sheila? It's 1350. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So just to give you a reference, 
In order to get the appellation, the Tuscan olive oil appellation, which is like you know a target for Tuscan olive oils, um, they ask you uh, for you to have 100 uh, oh. milligrams, oh. oh. and we we here we have 1300. I mean, just think. So this is like a medicine for the heart for your circulatory system. is is like completely. Uh, uh, it, it's amazing. In fact, the, the spice and the, and the bitter are usually tied to the content of polyphenols. When you don't have polyphenols, you will not be able to get any spiciness and any, any bitterness. Yeah, um, well, it was wonderful on those greens and herbs. Um, very, uh, the spice note was complementary um, to the to the herbal notes. Um, and I'm happy that you mentioned the cheeses because we actually do have some goat cheese here with some garlic and some herbs. Again, kind of maybe a little cliche, but I think I think it'll work. Um, so we're really, really enjoying uh, the olive oil. It's nice. It's very rich, rich. And yeah, you can also make a mousse like with the caletra. I yeah. think it's very good to make a mousse with ricotta cheese. Wow. And, and some Parmigiano, some grated Parmigiano, that would be very good. I okay. think you can Does try anybody it. have a recipe for olive oil cake? <laughs> there are yeah, there recipes. there are some good ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a lot of recipes. For that. There are a lot. I'm so sure. Really, you have a lot of ideas now for your for your tasting room, right? Yeah, I I do simple cheese plates, and uh, you know, so this this will be a nice addition to drizzle. You know. Over yeah, Burley. Um, you know the um the. Uh, I heard, just heard you say you're using goat cheese. I love good olive oil drizzled over goat cheese with fresh herbs, like chopped up. Yeah. Like, I think you said rosemary. I, I do it with mixture and even a little cracked black pepper sometimes, but I don't even need it with these oils because there's there's such a good picante to them. Yeah. But, uh, but you know how, I don't know if you've been in stores a lot, like, you know, special, you know, sort of, specialty stores um, will sell, especially from South America, uh, excuse me, from New Zealand and Australia, they do a lot of goat and sheep blends, a jar in olive oil. Yes. And also feta. Yes. And, but the oils, I don't think they're that good. I pull them out sometimes, some of them are better than others. I just buy the cheese like you just did and add the good oil on top of it. Wow. You know what I'm thinking of as well? Some nice uh, bucherol would be amazing with this. Some what? Some uh, bucherol. Uh, what was it? I couldn't oh, hear it. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a little noisy because I'm in my store, but I said bucherol. Oh, bucherol. Uh, yeah, yeah bucherol. Goat cheese, oh my yes, god. Yes, the French I, boucheron, yeah. Oh, the boucheron, I think, would just be, you know, amazing. Great, It'd be beautiful. Uh, very flavorful, aromatic, delicious, rich. Um, so three thumbs up. I'm sorry, actually over here is six thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Burley, Antonella, Helen, Elaine, uh, I know Ruth um, uh, had to leave. So she, uh, she says goodbye to all of you. Um, thanks to Cheryl. Um, and um, so I hope you enjoyed uh, this, uh, this tasting. Um, I, I learned a lot. And uh, so I don't know if you have anything else, any other questions or anything else uh, you'd like to add? Well, I, I just want to add something that these oils are available um, in my store in Newark. And I'm sure, you know, Sheila, you know, is going to talk about the website, but the wines as well as the oils are available. 
So if anyone, you know, wants to actually taste these wines, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to have them for at least, you know, a week. So come by and sample them. Great. Okay. Yeah, next time I'm in, in Newark, I'll, I'll uh, yeah, stop know. by. <laughs> So I'm, I'm waiting for all of you in the Starbucks. I understand you're planning. <laughs> <laughs> so and all of um, so all of the wines and olive oils we tasted today are available uh, on per to purchase on verovinogusto.com, or if you're in the Newark area, stop by and see Burley at her Divino uh, tasting room. So have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye -bye. Thank you Antonella. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, nice Antonella. to see you again. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.